Well, today's lesson, today's lesson, I'm sitting down, so I think it's teaching, so. But um, uh, today's message is his mighty power. And when we think of mighty power, and it's kind of, it goes along with uh, the Sunday school lesson, and it's interesting how that, um, you know, I, I wrote the sermon before I looked at the Sunday school lesson, you know, and it's, the Sunday school lesson is set in, you know, comes up every quarter and it's set for the Sundays. And, and my message is I try to just kind of go where, go where the flow is in my own mind and heart and spirit. And so it's, it's interesting how many times these things come together. And then, of course, if uh, we went through all of the songs today, they would give you an outline of what my message is. <laughs> so it's just one of those things how that God continues to work these um, different elements together in our life. Uh, there was uh, one of my friends, we were talking, and uh, I was talking about puzzle, you know, all things work together for good to those who love God. And I said, it's like a puzzle that, you know, that every piece fits in its own place. And he was reading something on the computer and puzzle was there. And he goes, we've just had a, a mind and space consortium, consortium in which two objects come together at one time. And I says, no, it's just the hand of God. You know, <laughs> it's, you know it's, it's the hand of God. And it helps us to recognize that there's, there's so much in, our, in the divine timing of things. There's so much in how that things fitly join together. We, we are, we try sometimes to see, you know, where's God at in this? And where's God at in that? And, and, you know, trying to see the hand of God. And sometimes it's very obvious, but we don't see it. <laughs> There's this uh, game show on uh, television where they, I, I don't know, I only saw it once or twice, and not for the whole thing, just little uh, uh, spots of it. And it, it said, you know, they have a picture, and they give you so many seconds to find something on the picture. You know, and uh, the one was there was these parking spaces and uh, there was cars there and one car there and then there was these numbers underneath it. And they were trying to have you decide what number the, would be the car, what number of the space would be the car. And you're looking at this and it's 7 and 17 and whatever and it goes through all this. It's just nothing adds up. And then, of course, the, the couple, whomever was trying to find it, the, the guy says, well, if you look at it upside down, it's in sequence of order. <laughs> 12, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. But if you had them upside down, it was, they didn't add up. So, and, and so it's simple things like that. We are looking for the hand of God. We're looking for where God as God is and in, in perhaps in the, the life events around us. And nothing adds up. And it's, you know, we're just looking at it from perhaps from the wrong perspective. In 1 John chapter 4, uh, John has this to say, uh, beginning at verse 4. My dear children, you come from God and belong to God. You have already won a big victory over those false teachers. For the spirit in you is far stronger than anything in the world. So we begin by recognizing the very first part. You come from God. You know, you're not, we're not just randomly showed up here on the planet and uh, you know that, that your parents and my parents and your grandparents and all that you know the, the Bible says that we are not here by the will of God by the will of man but by the will of God and that God has a special place for us and a special mission for us and special talents for us because that's why we have our background that's why we have um, our, our origin our native our native uh, country we have our nature native origin we have all those things that God is at work in in all things and so God knew we would be here he knew that we would be formed he knew us be, while we were informed in our mother's womb he knew us so God has this plan for our lives and so we're grateful for it and that sometimes we struggle to find it but sometimes we just need to relax and understand that we already found it we already found it because we have Christ in our heart and Christ in our life. And um, in my contemplations, I shared this in Sunday school, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about the universe. Did, were you able to get a picture of that, Jose? I was thinking about the universe and how that um, we, we see things, you know, here's just our 
planets that we're familiar with, but the, if you go out into the solar systems and out into the, you know, the deep space telescopes that we have, and you know, they, they, they go out millions of, of miles. And it's important that we understand that um, there's, you know, the vastness of space, God occupies it all. If we were to go, if, if a person was to go to one, the furthest extreme to the east, and the other one was to go the furthest extreme to the west, God is there. Not just around the planet, but the farthest, far out in the solar systems, as far as you can go in either direction, God is there. And so God created all of this, and he spoke it into existence. He has the name for them all, and he has a way, you know, everything is there, and it's all perfect in its own alignment, in its own orbit, in, the, in the, its own um, initiation, of its own gravity, of its own suns, of its own solar system. All those things are there, and they're all in perfect harmony. Because if they weren't in harmony, even the vastness of space, there's going to be collisions and you know, it's like, it, it, you know, people who say that uh, everything just kind of happened over, you know, billions of years. How many billions of years would it take <laughs> to put all of the universe, the, the, not only our universe, but the other solar systems in place? How many years, how many millions and billions of years would it take for all that to happen? And the chances of them happening... You know, the chances of them happening in such a way that they're all circular <laughs> and that they're all uh, in, a, in a gravitational field and that they're all in a rotation and that they're all spinning in, in a way that continues to hang everything in the balances. You know what the chances of that is? The chances of that is like you win in the billion dollar lotteries 500 times. <laughs> I don't know, I just made that up. I just, yeah, uh, sounded pretty good, didn't it? <laughs> so you, you come from God. So then we have all of this, all of this, the universe in place, and God's in there, and God's in every aspect of it, and then we have God deciding to become like us. <laughs> Jesus, born of a virgin. So the God who has all of this in place... All, you know, is in every aspect of the universe, is in every aspect of this creation. We see his hand. You know, people, um, I think, uh, get confused over God's creation and, and what he created and the, and, and the creator and the creation. God created the universe. God created the trees and the plants and the flowers and the birds and the bees, the, the, you know, I, uh, the animals. He created all of this. But we are his special creation because he breathed into us the breath of life. And God, his desire, the God who put all this in place, his desire was to have a relationship with us. <laughs> and his desire was that he would work in the hearts of believers. See, the God who put all of that vastness there, he doesn't need us. We need him. But he doesn't, you know, he could have created robots. He could have created, well, you serve me, give, you know. It wasn't that type of relationship. He desired a relationship with his people. And we see the, the, the personality. We see the character. We see the desire of, of God who created all that vastness, who is in all of that vastness. vastness. We see that in Jesus. We see what his character is. We see what his willing, willingness is to sacrifice. We see what his willingness is to love and, and to give. And he, he puts, it, puts the truth out. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, shall liberate your soul, liberate your thinking, liberate who you are. I, that's why, you know, over and over again, I, 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 say, I think and I, I say that Christians should be the most creative people on the planet because we are in touch with the creativity. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in us will quicken us. The same spirit was there in, in the beginning that created the heavens and the earth. You know, it's the same spirit that is inside of us, and so that creativity is alive in us. It's there inside of us, but we somehow just can't get beyond our own 
thinking, <laughs> our own imaginations, our own understanding of things, you know? <laughs> so, my, child, my dear children, you come from God. Let there be no doubt about it, you have a divine origin. <laughs> I know, you look at someone, you're not divine, but I am, you know. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know yeah. He says, you're divine? How did that happen? You know, but you see, we, we think of divine as uh, without flaw, and, but you, each of us have our own characteristics. We have our own qualities. We have our own uh, hang-ups. <laughs> uh, we have our own quirks. <laughs> And all of those quirks are so somebody else could get the, the that our quirks are the sandpaper that God is using to rub other people the wrong way so that they become smooth. See, I don't need this quirk, but you do. You see, so I'm here to make you smooth, you know. I'm here to uh, iron out the rough spots in your life, you, you know. So that's why I'm here, you know. And I don't have to be rubbed off anyway, you know. My, my bouncing against you is only to fix your problems. I don't have any. See? <laughs> Not true. <laughs> but we see how that works. <laughs> that we all have differences of opinions and differences of perspectives. And, uh, you know, what does love say? Greater love hath no man than he would lay down his life for his friend. So love gives us permission to be able to be in relationship and so that we don't destroy each other. <laughs> Love enables us to see things differently. God sees things differently. God loves us, so he gave himself for us so that we could have an understanding of what love really is. It's sacrificial. So, children, you come from God. If we come from him, we belong to him. You see, this life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. So in giving up my life, I actually find it. Jesus taught these parables and these mysteries. In giving up your life, you will, you will find life. In sacrifice, you will find fulfillment. In giving, you will find things being given. So we see in the people who are, are hoarding and the, the rich man who, um, you know, what am I going to do? I have so much. I need bigger barns, you know. My crops and my wealth are so great. You know, I don't see any need. All I see is the need to acquire more. <laughs> and, you know, Jesus called him a fool. This, this night your soul will be required of you. So, see, there, there's, there's this understanding that vastness and greatness comes with a, a price of giving, and giving comes with the, the understanding of being able to receive. And being able to receive comes with the ability to love and, and to share and to give to others. You see, this whole idea of, of, of our life, that, that God is here, we belong to him, and, and, and he belongs to us, and what he has, he wants to give us. And what we have, we give to him. You know, we're the ones that are... <laughs> He's the one that is shortchanged in the whole thing. He gets me, <laughs> you know? And don't, don't I say amen. Uh, <laughs> you know, he gets me. He gets us. And uh, he, he wants us to come to this level of understanding and, and the level of, 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 of allowing his spirit to teach us the truths of his word. And in so doing, he's not wanting us to be a different person He's wanting us to be changed from our heart. In our heart, the, the, the person that we are is, you know, yeah, we've got our sins, we've got our flaws, we've got our quirks, and if those things need to be changed, God is the one who will change them. He will show us in the mirror of his word how we need to become like him. So you have come from God and you belong to God, you, and, and you have already won a big victory over the false teachers. You see... I, I think of, I think of um, f wrong ideas, false doctrines. You know, people, well, let's, I used to maybe use the church as an illustration, the, the physical structure. Now, we have a furnace room, <laughs> you know, it's got coal in it, and, and we got a furnace room, we've got a kitchen, we've got a lower auditorium, <laughs> You know, we've got an upper auditorium, a, a sanctuary. We've got a doorway to enter. We've got a nursery. We've got a platform. And we've got offices. You know, we have all these things. What if I stood up and I preached every day on the furnace room? 
Every Sunday I preached on the furnace room. What's the furnace room? Hell, fire, and brimstone. All of you are just fuel for the fires of hell. <laughs> and we're going to, you know, before you get through here, you're going to feel like your soul is on fire. <laughs> and you're going to repent. You know, I've been places where people have done that. And, you know, it, and it's true. We have a furnace room. <laughs> and it's true there is an eternity when people... You know, throw God out the out to uh, you know throw God out of their lives. Uh, there's there's a place of eternal damnation. But you know what? That's not the entire church. That's not the entire mission of the body of Christ. Well, how about the doorway? The doorway. That's well. That's being saved. That's giving your life to Christ. Well, some people never get out of the doorway. There, you know, everything is about being saved. Everything is about knowing Jesus as your Savior. And once you know Jesus as your Savior, don't worry about it. You're good for eternity. You don't have to get into the sanctuary. You just got to get in the door. <laughs> you know, well, then you come to the sanctuary. Well, that's a place of worship. That's a place of teaching. So some people see it only as worship. And so they, they have a whole church built on worship. And then there's others that have a whole church built on teaching. And then there's people who want to be on the platform and always telling people where to go. <laughs> go to heaven? All right. So, so, there, you know, so we find that there in the nursery, oh, that's where people, you know, those people never grow up in their faith. So you see, there, there is, there's so much about God that sometimes we can become so focused on one thing, we don't see the rest of the church, the, the structure. People who sit in the parking lot. They just want to observe from afar. <laughs> you know, um, the, um, the three wise men were uh, from West Virginia. Did you know that? The three wise men were from West Virginia, and the three wise men were, wore, wore fire hats because they always worshipped from afar. <laughs> it's not even Christmas, and I thought of that one, huh? Don't worry, there's more where that came from. <laughs> that's, that's one of my quirks, you know, that just rubs you the wrong way. So why did he do that? That was so, yeah, just rubbing you the wrong way, you know. God will smooth you out and he'll use me to do it. So, but you see that we've already won a great victory. We don't have to worry about winning. Christ already has. We don't have to worry about things being straightened out. God is already in control. We don't have to fix people. God is, in the, God is the one who is going to work in your hearts and lives. You see, if, if we have a problem with other Christians, we need to pray for them. You know, how long, and pray that God will do, uh, do a work in their life and how that God is going to do. Because here we are. Can you imagine any of us declaring that, you know what, our primary goal is to ruin the church. And our primary goal is to hurt other believers. I don't think anybody has that on their agenda. Our agenda is to love and to forgive and to deal with. And, you know, sometimes we don't see things the wrong way. We're standing in the nursery and complaining about the furnace room. You know, it, it's, you know, people are in different parts and different places in their relationship with God. But God is at work. And, and so what we have to do, we're trying to do, is to recognize how that God is at work in every aspect. The whole building is fitly joined together to this heat. The furnace room is to make sure that we're comfortable in the sanctuary. You know, and the nursery is for the, the, some of the children who need to be there. They don't want to be out here listening to me, <laughs> you know, and that's okay. Now, if you're, if you're, if you're 40 years old and want to sit in a nursery because you don't want to listen to me, then we have a problem. But, you know, if you're four years old and you want to be in a nursery, that's okay, two and three, all right. But we have, that, we have a great victory, a great victory. We already have won. The devil is already defeated. Eternity is already set. The resurrection is already in place because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. So we have this. We have this great victory. Remember this. If you can only lift 50 pounds, 
God is not going to give you a hundred pound problem. <laughs> if you can only lift 50 pounds, God is not going to give you a hundred pound victory. Because you can't lift it. You can't, we can't take, God knows exactly what we have need, what we need. He knows exactly what we need to, in order to, to grow on to the next step, to grow on in our relationship with God. He knows exactly what is necessary for us. And so God is at work in every aspect of our being that the puzzle, the intersection of, of life and events and God and the Word are exactly as they should be. They're exactly as they should be. It doesn't add up, but it does. <laughs> it doesn't add up, but it does. And in, in God's math, in God's way of looking at it, we're seeing things upside down and it's and it all in sequence. And we, we can't figure it out, but it's all in sequence. And God is at work in every one of those sequential things and that we are exactly where we need to be, going through exactly what we need to have and being confronted with the problems that we need to be confronted with because God is at work preparing us for tomorrow because God's blessing is coming and God's greatness is going to be revealed. So how are we going to deal with it? We're going to learn how to deal with it today through facing the difficulties and facing the, the, the um, blessings receiving the blessings in our life today so that God can take care of tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> Glad we got that through. All right. So, the, for the spirit in you is far stronger than anything in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater, for the spirit in you is far stronger than anything in the world. Anything that is in the world around us, that which is anti-God, the world, Anything that is anti-God, you are greater and stronger than anything. Any of that. There's just no comparison. You've got Jesus who, you know, when Jesus came and he lived his life and gave us the, the, his, his teachings and, and, and his, his death on the cross and his resurrection and his ascension to the Father and the Holy Spirit's coming, we have power that is greater than anything that's in this earth and on this planet we have to recognize that we already have the victory so if i already have the victory then how then do i respond to the problem if god has an outcome then i need to respond according to his word if god has a promise that he's going to deliver us then as i face the difficulty i know that i'm going to be delivered so let's deal with this and move on if I, and, and I see that the obstacles in front of me are not set there to destroy me, they are set there to teach me, to help me, to prepare myself so that I can be receptive to the next thing that's coming. Because how will I receive tomorrow's blessing if I can't even take care of today's? I'm not talking about problems, blessings. If I think that today's blessings come by my hand and my abilities and my giftings, I will never be able to receive tomorrow's blessing. It's too big for me to pick up. <laughs> I can't pick it up. If I can't pick up today's, how am I going to pick up tomorrow's? So, Jeremiah 29, 11. This is God's word on the subject. It's verse 10. And as soon as Babylon's 70 years are up, and not a day before. You see, the children of Israel were in a particular place because of a particular problem in their life. And so God took them to, had them be conquered by Babylon, and, and Babylon's way of, of, uh, of uh, dealing with their captives was to pull them out of their own environment and take them to Babylon and integrate them into the Babylonian society. Well, the promise came to the children of Israel that they are going to be there and they are going to be in Babylon for 70 years, not a day sooner, not a day later. They are going to be there and then they're going to be setting things in place to come back. I'll show up. This is verse 29, 11. I'll show up and take care of you as I promised and bring you back home. You see, if we come from God, 
John, 1 John 4, verse 4, My dear children, you come from God and belong to God. If we come from God, if we believe this and we understand this, that we are here on a divine assignment to live our life to the honor and glory of God and that we are here to allow the Spirit of God and the blessings of God and the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit to be operative in our life, to bring honor and glory to God, we've got a purpose. Now, God is saying, I'll show up and take care of you as I promised and bring you back home. If we came from God, we need to be united with God and one day we're going to spend an eternity with God. He's going to bring us home. We get out of this place. You know, sometimes we'd say, um, you know, the chances of getting out of this world alive are pretty slim. (laughs) You know? Did I tell you the joke about the guy who went to Israel with his mother-in-law? I did. Well, I'll tell it anyhow. Uh, he went to Israel with his mother-in-law, and his mother-in-law died. And, the, and, and this undertaker says, well, you know, for $500, we can have her cremated and left here, and she can just and leave her body here in Israel, or you can ship her back home, and it's going to cost you $20,000. And the uh, guy says, you know what? I think I'll take her home. Reason was? Years ago, somebody rose from the dead, and I don't want any to take that chance of her raising from the dead. I'm sending her home. <laughs> I thought that was funny. There's another one. There's another joke. I know I, have to, I only got a few minutes, but that's okay. We have to learn to laugh. Because laughter, whenever we laugh, it, it releases endorphins in our body that makes us feel better. And the Word of God is that which not only makes us feel better in our spirit and in our bodies, it makes us understand things and be relieved in our minds. You know, you need to let your mind relax. (laughs) And, you know, especially me, mine's all confused sometimes. But uh, uh, but I'm I'm believing that it's going to be better, okay? So... uh, so we need to laugh, and we need to let go of our prejudices and our concerns that distort, distort and destroy us. But anyhow, there was this lady, her husband died, and she got $20,000, or we'll just say $30,000 for the, for the funeral. And she was telling her friends that she's broke. And, and it's the lady, it's the, her friend says, well, how can you be broke? You said you got $30,000 for the funeral. And she says, well, I spent uh, 5000 for the funeral and 25000 on a memorial stone. She goes, 25,000 on a memorial stone. What size of a stone did you get? She said, about two and a half carats. <laughs> she looked at her finger, you know, got a diamond ring, you know. That's a memorial stone. <laughs> yeah. So you see, God is the God of the universe, and God has put all this stuff in place, in, in place and he wants us to realize that he is taking care of us. And that, it, you know, for the children of Israel, before they went into captivity, they knew they were going to be there for 70 years. You see, we don't know where we're going to be and how long, you know. If, if the congregation of this church knew that I was going to be here 36 years later, I don't know if they'd have voted me in. <laughs> I don't think they'd have, they'd have said yes to that because we can't stand anybody for that long. And, and, and the idea is that we don't know. I had no idea that we would be here 36 years later. I mean, I, I, for me, maybe, you know, at the time period, it's three to four years and you move on. And it's just like that in many denominations and so on. Even in our denomination, three to five years is pretty good time and you move on. But it's surprising how many people now, that whole trend is reversed and people are staying in congregations a lot longer. And... And you see that, but God has a purpose in all this. And God has a purpose for the people that we touch, the people that we pray for, the people that we minister to. You know, God has a place and a purpose for our life and our ministry. God has a purpose for your life and your ministry. God has a plan. And all of these things going on in our life have a purpose. And so no matter what the purpose is, we are to be thanking God that he is going to work this out in a, in a pattern, in a plan, and in a way that's just going to blow us away. 
It's like, we're going to marvel because we haven't begun to imagine. We can't even imagine the things that God has in store for us. It's beyond your imagination. So why don't we start looking for the things that are in our hearts and our lives and in our imaginations, and we put them out there. Sure, they're far-fetched. Some of them are nuts. (laughs) But you know what? God has a way of taking something very small and making it come true. Do you know that David, when he faced Goliath, you got this man who's probably 10 foot, 12 foot tall, weighs hundreds of pounds. His spear, the tip of his spear is like 10 or 12 pounds. You know, his shield, some, some bearer carries his shield. Took all, all one man could do is to carry just his shield. And what did God give to David? He gave him about a two, three, four ounce stone. What in, how on earth is a little stone going to affect such a big problem? But you know what? David didn't see the, uh, Goliath as a problem. He saw God as a source. Okay? If you want to know, you don't, tell, you don't talk about how big your giant is. You talk about how big God is. And when God is the greatest, the biggest, the the supplier of every need, he is going to give to you the little thing that you need to take on the biggest of problems and make them fall. Because you have the skill to take the little thing and to bring down the big thing. You see, when the children of Israel, when they they were supposed to go into the promised land, they came back, the ten spies came back and said, you know what? We are as grasshoppers in their sight, and then they see us as grasshoppers. They, the ten spies, saw themselves as grasshoppers in, in comparison to the giants, and then to the people of the land of, of, of Israel that they were supposed to go and take. They saw themselves as grasshoppers in their sight, and they convinced themselves that they saw them as grasshoppers. You see, so we can convince ourselves that our problems see us the same way we see them. What we need to see is that we need to see our problems as God sees them. Things to be conquered, things to be dealt with, problems to be overcome, things to be solved. God is at work And he is greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He's already given us the victory. We just have to figure out how he's going to do it. And as we approach the the giant, as we approach the difficulties, God has already given us exactly what we need to take the giant down. And David was that way. He picked up five stones, put one in his slingshot, took the giant down. And that was the thing that propelled him into his popularity for, uh, of a national hero. And in our lives, we don't know what one thing, what one thing we need to do to get us to the place of victory. And God is at work. And David just didn't com- com- pick up the slingshot. He'd been practicing the whole time. He'd been watching sheep. He'd been knocking flies off of the rocks at 100 yards, you know? You know? He'd been, he had been playing with that slingshot for his whole life. But he was able to take out the lion and the bear. He knew the giant Goliath would go down too. That's what God is doing. He's taking us through different areas of our lives and he's giving us the victory. We've already won the victory. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? Father, we thank you that we receive this in our hearts and our lives. We receive this word, Lord, by your spirit to teach us and to ground us in our our understanding of our great God, God, our our great God who fills the entire universe and yet fills our hearts. We thank you for touching us and may we see how big our God is in light of the problems, the, the little perspectives of life that our problems really are, that you are there to give us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. God bless you.